right, and we greet you today in the name above every name. Welcome to our online service this morning from the Harvest Baptist Tabernacle of the beautiful historic city of Jonesboro, Georgia, located one block from the famous Lake Spivey, where all the rich people live. And we're glad to have you with us today, and I trust you'll take your home or your car, wherever you're listening, and turn it into a sanctuary. He said, well, two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst, and you can worship the Lord with us, and I trust you will do that. I appreciate our people understanding today our point of having online church, being this close to Christmas and the uptick of the cases, and we will do online again Wednesday. I'm the Lord willing, Lord willing, we don't have much of an uptick. We're looking forward to the services in person next Sunday, the first Sunday of January, the first Sunday of 2021. And we are sure hoping that 21 turns things around. And uh, But we want to praise the Lord for his goodness. He's still a worthy, wonderful Savior. We want to begin our service today with a special word of prayer. Of course, we want to pray for all of those that's battling the sickness. Please pray for them. Continue to pray for Brother Tim. He's still in the hospital. He needs a miracle. He needs a touch from God. And God's able to touch our brother. Pray for others that are home uh, dealing with this. And then pray for a lot of our members that are dealing with issues not even related to the COVID-19, uh, burdens and problems and other sicknesses in their family. I got a call this morning from Brother Richard Poole. He teaches one of our Sunday school classes, a preacher here. We love Brother Richard. His boy Asa, his seven-year-old daughter, is in the hospital in serious condition. So pray for her this morning that the hand of the Lord would touch her and lift her up. And I know all of us have prayer requests. We have needs. We have burdens. But I'm glad we have a God that we can go to at a time of need and ask his grace to be sufficient and everything. So let's pray today. Joe Moats, why don't you come pray for us, son? And we'll have some music and then a message from the Word of God. And we'll be back online again tonight at 6 o'clock, the Lord willing. So let's pray that God will bless these broadcasts today. Pray for us, son. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, so thankful, uh, for, Lord, for the opportunity we have uh, to come to your house and worship today. Lord, so many people are at home watching. I pray, Lord, you would be with them today. I pray you bless them. I pray, Lord, that you would bind back all distractions, every demon of hell and the devil himself that wants to disrupt and distract your word from going forth. I pray that you'd bind the strong man this morning. I pray, God, you speak to our hearts. Lord, you know each and every individual need, each and every personal need that everybody's dealing with this morning. God, I pray that you would speak to us on a personal and an individual basis exactly what we need from your word. God, I pray for the music today. God, that it would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ above measure and that it would, it would encourage our hearts in this time that we're living in. I pray for the preaching of the Word of God. I pray for my pastor. God, I pray you give him the strength and the breath that he needs this morning. I pray, God, that you would fill him with fresh oil and a fresh anointing. Touch him fresh and anew, God, as he preaches. And fill him with your power, God. I pray for those who are watching that may be lost and they've come across this program. I pray for old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction to squeeze their heart that they may be saved this morning and end this, uh, this year and start the new year. God, in the family of God, what a blessing that would be. I pray you'd encourage our people today. God, we pray for Brother Tim, yes. Brother Richard Poole and his family. God, those of our church family that are sick. I pray, God, you would lift them up and touch them as only you can do is our prayer. We'll thank you for it, for you and you alone are worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's sing the first Noel, brother. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I love this song. First Noel. Sing for us, brother Tom.
the red book, glory to his name. A couple of verses of that. Amen. Praise God. Sing with us at home, down at the cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously, I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of Found. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. My heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I love that song, and that's what we do every day of our life. We bring glory and honor to the name that is above every name. On top of dealing with the COVID corona crisis, we've had a lot of our members this year have to deal with a myriad of other sicknesses. And Brother Jerry's been out of commission for a couple of months now with neck surgeries and all of that and the doctor told Jerry it's a possibility that's broke my heart that he would never sing again and he need to be prepared for that and so we've been praying for Jerry and I called him last night and I said Jerry by faith if you have to squeak one out let's give God the glory and the devil a big old black eye so Jerry walk on over here and just do your best and sing. It is no secret what God can do. We're gonna dedicate this to all of those that are sick, battling sickness, battling issues with your family. You remember this, there is no secret to what God can do. Jerry, good to see you up and going, buddy. Amen, it's good Love. to be up and going. It's good to see you up and going. God Amen. Is going a miracle day God is good. At COVID-11 and back preaching, I mean, no time. And we praise God for that. The doctor said I'd never, probably could never sing again. And I may not ever be able to sing like I did, which was never great, but I do love to sing for the Lord. And I want it to magnify Him. That's all I ask. It is no secret what God can do. The child to bring out the news. Another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was there someone new? Well, you may have long or added strength or courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I have news for you. It is no secret what God can do, what He's done for others. Believe me, He'll do 
for you with arms wide open he'll pardon you it is no secret what God can do there is no night or in God's light you'll never walk alone you'll always feel at home no matter where you roam cause there is no power can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what my God can do. What he's done for others he will do for you with arms wide open he'll pardon it is no secret what God can do it is no secret what God can do. Great job, Jerry. I believe that guitar picking brought you right on through that one. Amen. And to see you up going, singing. And buddy, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, give honor to the Lord. I told my wife I may not ever have the breath and lung capacity. Well, I don't know, but I'm going to give him what I got. He's the Lord of what's left. God is good. Uh, don't forget, we'll be online again tonight in the 6 o'clock hour. And we'll be bringing a message tonight concerning our theme of, for next year. We sure hope our theme for next year goes better than our theme for this year. And uh, we are excited about what the Lord is going to do. You know, Jesus could come and fix it all. And if he doesn't come, we're going to be faithful and doing our part because he's a good and a wonderful God. We're going to see Jesus one day. And the Bible said we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I don't know what all that means, but whatever it is, I'm looking forward to it. And I like it, and I thank God for that. Brother Tom, take us into the preaching of the Word of God. I believe you're going to sing that great song, When We See Christ. Am I right? Amen. One of these days, all this will be past. It will be worth it. Oftentimes, the day seems long, our trials. Hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his pride away. All tears for Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race. 
day Jesus is coming and we shall see him. I want you to turn this morning to Psalm 40 please in your Bible and hold your place there and turn to Hebrews chapter number 10. We're going to compare this morning these two verses of scripture one in the Old Testament and one in the New. You've often heard me say that there are no contradictions in the word of God. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed and they never ever contradict but always complement one another. The Old Testament is just as inspired as the New Testament for when Jesus made that statement in John's Gospel chapter 5 where he said search the scriptures for they are they which testify of me. He was referring explicitly to the Old Testament because at that time the New Testament had not been completed and canonized. And I'm just saying today, you can trust your Bible. From the first book of the Bible, Genesis, to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, you can trust your Bible. My dad used to say you can even trust the cover because it says Holy Bible. In fact, Dad used to say you can trust the inside of the cover because it says genuine cowhide. Amen. It's a genuine book. But uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, they both are the Word of God. The old is the new concealed. The new is the old revealed. And they always complement and never contradict. But I want to compare two verses today. Psalm 40, verse number 7 the Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 7. Now most of the time when you turn to Psalm 40, we think of the first three verses. I call them those wonderful salvation verses where we were in the pit, we were in the miry clay, and the Lord inclined, he heard, he brought us out, set us upon a rock, put that new song in our mouth, and I love those verses. But I believe if you'll read on down to verse number seven, it shows you why and how God is able to lift up fallen humanity because a Savior was going to come and did come into the world. And right in the midst of these wonderful salvation deliverance verses, you have a prophecy, a prediction concerning the coming of Jesus Christ. Notice Psalm 40, verse number 7. Then said I, now this is the preexistent Christ speaking. 
What a wonderful doctrine that is. But then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. So in the volume of the book it is written that someone is coming. And notice verse 8 he says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. You say this was David speaking. No, this is David, the human instrument speaking, but in the inspiration of God, this is the preexistent Christ speaking. Lo, I come, Jesus says, and it is written, listen to this now, it is written in the volume of the book. And so you search from Genesis to Malachi in the volume of the book, you'll find it is written of Jesus that said he was coming to do the will of God. Now I want you to come to Hebrews now, chapter number 10 and verse number seven. And I don't want to get off on a secondary subject, but I'd love to preach here on the purity, the authenticity, the impeccability of the scripture. Here is a direct quote from the Old Testament in the New Testament under the same inspiration of the same Holy Spirit. Notice what it said in chapter 10, verse number seven. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. What does it say? To do thy will, O God. So here you have a prophecy and you have a fulfillment of the prophecy. The one that is coming is written about in the volume of the book. And the one that is coming according to the volume of the book is coming to do the will of God. And what was Jesus' main subject? I've come to do the will of him that sent me. So it is no doubt whatsoever that this prophecy, this fulfillment is talking about the coming the birth of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me say, by it being prophesied in the old, fulfilled in the new, I believe I can be safe in saying the birth of Jesus Christ was not an accident. I was listening to the radio the other day at all of the political ads and almost got nauseated. In fact, I did. If you are a preacher or if you claim to be a preacher, no matter what denomination it is or the color of your skin, and you say that abortion is okay, you got problems because you're not reading the same book I'm reading, filled with the same spirit I'm filled with, or preaching the same Christ I'm preaching. And that is a shame that millions of people are duped into that but I was listening to this particular ad and it talked about unwanted and unexpected pregnancies. And a lot of times when you get mad at somebody, when I was a boy, you'd look at them and say, oh, you weren't meant to be. You were an accident. Now listen to me. I don't believe no one is here by accident. Now, now you may have been unwanted. I'm not going to lie. I mean, there's some people that probably were not unwanted. I hope that's none of our members are that way. But uh, let me tell you something. If God holds life in his hand, and he does, if God didn't want you to live, you wouldn't have lived. But they talk about unexpected and unwanted pregnancies. A lot of times when I was growing up, you'd get mad at somebody. You'd say, oh, you, you're an accident. You, you, you're a whoops. Oops, oops, oops. I do remember one time at the camp meeting, Brother Billy was on the platform and this missionary was there. And Brother Billy said, what's your name, brother? And he said, Brother so-and-so. And he said, this is my 10 children. And so it was a daddy and a wife and 10 children. And Brother Billy looked at that youngest boy. He was about six. I won't forget this. He said, hey, buddy, he said, what's your name? And he said, stop it. Stop it. And uh, a lot of times we think about accidental or unwanted or oops or 
your surprise or I had my surprise package. But can I tell you this morning, according to the word of God, the birth of Jesus Christ was not an unexpected or an unwanted pregnancy. The birth of Jesus Christ was not an afterthought nor an accident. You can't look down at that babe in a manger and say, oops, it was meant to be. His birth was not an accident. Jesus Christ was not an unexpected or an unwanted pregnancy. This world as a whole may have rejected him, but I'm glad everybody didn't. This world as a whole may not have been looking for him, but there were some who were. And he came just like God said that he would. And in light of that, I got to thinking of the four births in the Bible that was pre-announced by the angels of God. Out of all the people that were born and lived and died in the Bible, there are four particular cases where their birth was pre-announced by the angels of God. And I'd say this morning that if an angel pre-announced your birth, it definitely was not unexpected or unwanted nor an accident. There are four men in the Bible whose birth was pre-announced by the angels of God. First of all, Isaac. Second of all, Samson. Third, John the Baptist. And number four, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to build a message today around the pre announcement of these births and every one of these is a picture of the person and plan of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ his birth was not an accident number one look at Isaac before Isaac was born his birth was pre-announced by the angel of God I've wrote this down this morning that Isaac was the son of promise. Whenever you read about Isaac, you are reminded of the promises of God. God kept his promise concerning the birth of Isaac. God kept his promise concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may I say to all of those that are listening today, God will keep every promise that he has made to you and I. Remember how God called Abraham away from his brother and away from his mother and away from his father. They were all heathens. They were idol makers. They were idol worshipers. And God called him to come apart and be the father of a nation that will honor the living and true God and one day Abraham is standing by the shore I didn't say beach he was standing by the shore and he looked down into the sand and God said you see all of them grains of sand that's how many children you're going to have he said look up there in the stars you see all them stars that's how many children you're going to have he meets this little gal by the name of Sarah and they are married but all of a sudden it dawns on them her womb is barren and seemingly they're not going to have a child. I'm sure in their 20s they didn't worry about it. In their 30s they didn't worry about it. In their 40s they may have thought about it. In their 50s they may have doubted it a little bit But I promise you on Abraham's 100th birthday and Sarah's 90th birthday, they said, forget it. They didn't name him, stop it. They named him, forget it. And and I'm not being sacrilegious, but if you're listening to our program today and 
Sir, you are 100 and your wife is 90. You're probably not going to be making any visits to the cigar shop anytime soon. And I mean, here they are. He's 100 and she's 90 and still no promised child. But one day an angel came and told Abraham. And just like a nosy woman in the next room listening through the tent wall, she hears what the angel says to Abraham, and she did what most of all of us would have done except faint. She laughed. She laughed. Now, I'm sure today there are some ladies in our church that if an angel told your husband, that you were going to have a child, you might would laugh. After you fainted and we woke you up with some smelling sauce, you might laugh. How many believe today God gets the last laugh? God said, I'll tell you what, you want something to laugh about? I'm going to make you name him Isaac. And the Hebrew definition for Isaac means joyful, hilarious, or laughter. God said, I'm going to give you something to really laugh about. I'm going to put some joy and some laughter in your life. And ladies and gentlemen, just exactly like God said early one morning, a birth is taking place. And I believe as Isaac makes his first cry, it is a cry not of sorrow, but of laughter because God kept his promise to Abraham. God kept his promise to Sarah. God kept his promise to the little nation of Israel. God kept his promise to the world. And he said to Abraham, and Isaac thy seed and thy name shall be great. And to show you how serious God was in keeping his promise, between 30 to 38 years after that, he takes him to Mount Moriah because God said, I want you to offer your only son to me for a burnt offering. And Abraham, in complete obedience to God, and you don't understand that until you read the New Testament, that the reason why Abraham had enough faith to put that boy on that altar because his faith was so strong, he believed if Isaac did die on that altar that God was big enough and able enough and powerful enough to raise him from the dead. You say, what gave them that kind of faith? Well, my soul, he had seen God touch the dead body, the dead womb of a woman. And if God can touch the, touch the dead womb of a woman, he can touch the dead body of a little boy. And God was so intent keeping his promises that on Mount Moriah, as the knife was coming down, God stopped him. And that was a ram caught in the thicket. And he offered the ram in the stead of his son. And God is saying forever, if I decree it, if I say it, if I promise it, if I proclaim it, you can stand upon it because the birth of Isaac shows us that he and Jesus as well is the promised son. And I want to tell you something. When God let Jesus come into this world, he kept his promise. And I'm glad when he healed the sick and raised the dead, he kept his promise. When he died for us on Calvary, he kept his promise. When he swept out the grave for you and I, he kept his promise. When he ascended on high, he kept his promise. And that day you realized you was a sinner and you called upon the name of the Lord and he saved you. He kept his promise. And every day of your life and mine, God stands and keeps his promise. And one day he's coming in power and great glory to take his children, hallelujah, out of this sin cursed world. And, and again, and again we'll say, God keeps his promises. And I'm glad today we can say with well, a songwriter, standing on the promises. Because this birth that was pre-announced by angels shows that Jesus, Isaac, the promised son. Secondly, Samson, Samson. And let me say this to you young preachers and Bible students everywhere. We love types. 
And we use types. Jesus himself used types and figures. In fact, the Bible said in Hebrews that the old tabernacle was a picture, a foreshadow, or a figure of the heavenly things. But remember this in your preaching. Remember this in your Bible study. All types break down somewhere. That's why we don't build New Testament church doctrine on types. We use the types, we use the full shadows to illustrate, but remember all types somewhere break down. And you say, well, I don't understand how you could take somebody like Samson the way he ended it and compared it to our Lord. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's not focus how Samson ended. Let's focus on his birth and how he began. God forewarned, God foretold his birth to his mom and his dad. God said, I've got a special plan for this boy. He'll be a Nazarite from his birth. He'll be separated to serve me and honor me and my Holy Spirit will come upon him. And when my Holy Spirit comes upon him, you know what happened. He became a powerful man. In fact, the most powerful man in the Bible. When you think about strong men in the Bible, you don't think about uh, Arab being bossed around by his wife. You, you, you think about Samson, the strong man, because supernatural strength came upon him when the power and the Spirit of God came upon him. Oh, he could carry the gates of the city. He could take the jawbone and slay all of the Philistine army. He was so strong with his arms. He could break down the, the, the temple, uh, the pillars that held up the temple of a heathen God. No man could bind him when God was on him. No man could defeat him when God was on him. No man could subdue him when God was upon him. When the Spirit of God came upon this man, he was head and shoulders above the rest. Oh, not only does Isaac speak forth of the promised son, but the foretelling of the birth of Samson, it speaks forth of the powerful son that when the Spirit of God came upon this boy who the angels pre-announced his birth, he would have supernatural power from the Spirit of God that would come upon him. Boy, I'm glad at 30 years old, Jesus went down to the banks of the Jordan and that was John the baptizer baptizing the converts. But when Jesus walked up, instead of baptizing the convert, he baptized the converter and to show forth his righteousness, his death and burial and resurrection. John baptized Jesus, and when he brought him up out of that liquid grave, that heavenly dove, oh, that represents the Holy Spirit, came and fluttered and landed on his shoulders, and God, oh, my soul, rolled back the covers of heaven and spoke with a voice that shook the foundations of the earth. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And right there, Isaiah 64 prophecy was fulfilled because he left there and he walked in that temple and he flipped open that Old Testament and he read from Isaiah 64 where it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And he said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give sight to the blind. I'm gonna give liberty to those who are in captive because the power of God that's gonna to come upon me, I'll do supernatural things and you'll see the power of God demonstrated in my life. My soul, what do you think John 1 14 is dealing with? When it said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and full of truth. That's what Jesus meant in Matthew 28 when he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And brother, he left that river side under the direct power of the Holy Spirit of God and brother nothing could stand in his way while he gave sight to the blind he gave healing to the sick he gave resurrection to the dead he gave water
water to the thirsty and he gave food to the hungry and he unstopped the ears of the deaf and loosed the tongues of the dumb. He befriended the lonely and he saved the sinner and he comforted the feeble because the power of God powerful savior the devil couldn't stand in his presence sickness couldn't stand in his presence inability couldn't stand in his presence he met all needs because there's no boundaries or borders and limits to what he can do because Jesus Christ was not only the promised son he's the powerful son and can I remind you today 2020 he's never never lost his power and guess what he never will Samson was strong enough to carry the gates of the city but Jesus was strong enough <laughs> woo, to bear the sins of many Whew. Lord have mercy Samson was strong enough to tear down the pillars of the temple, but Jesus was powerful enough that he said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll, I'll build it back. And he wasn't talking about Solomon's temple or the temple of a heathen God. He was talking about the, his body, the temple, that Jesus Christ, by his own power, would get up from the grave. And where Samson was a man, and he was tempted and he fell in sin and lost its power. Our Lord Jesus Christ was a man and he was tempted. Oh, what Jesus went through in that wilderness temptation in Matthew 4. Oh, what little temptation Samson went through is not a drop in the bucket, but where Samson as a man was tempted and fell and lost its power. Jesus, a man, was tempted and did not fail and did not lose his power and brother powerful enough to conquer death and hell and the grave my hope is built today not on a weak religion not on a fake religion not on a fairy tale savior but Jesus Christ the promised son and the powerful son hallelujah there's nothing that God cannot do praise God I felt like preaching this bell He's the promised son. He's the powerful son. And then you come to the New Testament. And there's another birth that's pre-announced by the angels of God. And it's the birth of John the Baptist. God speaks to his daddy. And that revelation of God was so strong to his dad that he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. Nine months later, how, how, how many of you women here would love to go nine months and your husband not say, anyway, and after nine months, his mama's Elizabeth is in there having that baby. And they say, John, your baby's here. And John, he can't speak, but he writes down his name. Call him John, call him John. And when they called him John, Holy Ghost touched Daddy, and Daddy had a shouting spell right there. Why did he want to call him John? Because God had told his father, I've got a plan for his life. I got a purpose for his life. I got a reason for his life. He'll be a spiritual bulldozer. He'll be a forerunner. He'll blaze the trail. He's not the light, but he's the path that leads to the light. He's not the Savior, but he's the one that appoint men to the Savior. He's not the Lamb of God, but he'll be the one that will introduce the Lamb of God. For Isaac's the promised son. Samson was the powerful son. But listen to this. John the Baptist was the purposeful son. He was not an accident. God had a plan for his life. God was so uh, wonderful, so intricate. God was so to the detail. Not only did he prophesy the birth of Christ, and let me say, the virgin birth of Christ uh, in the city of Bethlehem, virgin birth of Christ, the angels and the stars and all of that. But God is such into details. He even predicted and prophesied that there would be a four 
forerunner to the birth of his son. He called him this, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Wow. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years before Elizabeth was expecting this little boy by the name of John, John God said, a forerunner is going to come. Here's his purpose. He'll be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, the Jews and even the Romans that were living in Jerusalem at the time, they had heard priests. They had heard rabbis. They had heard many lectures given in the synagogue. But I promise you, here's country talk, they ain't never heard nobody preach like John the Baptist. First of all, he was anointed. Holy Ghost was on him. That would make anybody's preaching better. Amen. And very plain, <laughs> very, very bold. In fact, he was so bold, you ever heard of a preacher that preached his heart out? John preached his head off. Bold. Bold. He was the forerunner. I, I love to tell this. His mama, Elizabeth, was six months along in the motherly way. And the Virgin Mary had just heard from the angel. So she goes to see, I believe it must have been her aunt, and uh, goes to see uh, Aunt Elizabeth. Now, you got to understand now, she's six months along. John is just in his mama's belly, just six months in development. And, and Elizabeth, his mama, listens to the Virgin Mary. I love telling this. As she begins to tell Elizabeth what that angel had said to her. And I'm not making this up. This is in your Bible. Elizabeth is standing there with that little baby, six months in development, listening to what Mary is telling her the angel said. And Elizabeth went, whoo! You know what happened? John the Baptist was only six months in development. The Bible said he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he leaped for joy in his mother's womb. John the Baptist had never been born the first time. And he had a shouting spell. And I don't understand why Baptists who claim to be born again don't say amen once in a while. I mean, he's in his mama's womb, not even six months in development leaping and shouting for joy. I guarantee you Mama Elizabeth felt that. Can you imagine? Well, glory to God. Can you imagine being in that little home that day? There stands the Virgin Mary telling to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, what the angel had said to her. And boy, she's a kicking and she's a jumping around. God is in that room. God said, I got a purpose. I got a plan for that boy. He's not going to be the light, but he's going to blaze the trail for the light. He's not going to be the life of men, but he'll blaze the trail for the life of men. He is not the Lamb of God that he'll be offered, but he'll be the one that introduces the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He'll be a forerunner. He'll be a spiritual bulldozer. He'll make a path. He's got a plan. And the Bible said in John chapter number one, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And God used him in a powerful way. After John exposed the wickedness of the king, he said, did it make the king mad? No, but it made his wife and girlfriend real mad. And they put John in that inner prison. And John being a man, John being fleshly, John being human, well, the devil began to attack his mind. Boy, he'll do you that way. He'll do me that way. Oh, did you really mean it? Oh, when you called on the Lord, did you really mean it? Well, if I didn't mean it, I wouldn't have called on him. I can tell you that right now. And boy, he'll put all kind of things in your mind. And old John Jerry's in that inner prison and 
the devil's working on his mind and finally John sees somebody come by his cell. He says, hey, come here a minute. Do me a favor. Jesus is over there in the next village. Go over there and ask him, is he the Christ? Or do I need to look for another? And you say, shame on him. Shame on him. Have you not ever wondered and had thoughts in your mind and amidst the pressures and the storms of life? You say, but Brother Joe, John was there in the water with Jesus when the dove came and the clouds rolled back and he heard the audible voice of God. Yeah, and I was there when the blood of Jesus saved my soul and washed my sins away. But sometime in the valley, your mind wanders and your faith shakes. Is he the Christ? Ask him. I don't know who this messenger was. It's unnamed. But I do know this. If if it had been me, that John the Baptist, if it had been me, that John the Baptist would have said, you go ask Jesus, is he for real? This is how I would have done it. I said, hi, Jesus. I need to ask you a question. It's not mine. It ain't me. I would never have a question like this. It's for a friend of mine. Are you the Christ? Does he need to look for another Boy, I'm glad what Jesus didn't do. You say, what do you mean? He didn't say ugly things about John. He didn't rebuke John. He didn't even question John. He didn't say, well, you go ask him. Was he not there when the dove came? Go ask him, was he not there when the audible voice of my father came? Many people, most people have never heard the audible voice of my father. Why, he ought to know better than that. No, I'm glad he didn't do that. And you know what? If you got a need today, and you got a doubt today, and you got a question today, he's not mad at you. He won't rebuke you. He'll just wrap you up in your arms and whisper sweet peace to your soul and remind you he's still good. He says what his answer was to that unnamed servant. Hey, you go and tell John the blinds are seeing and the lame is a walking and them dead people are, having the, are getting raised from the dead and them poor folks are having the gospel preached to him. And as that messenger was walking away, Jesus addressed that crowd and said, hey, you know that guy he's asking about, John the Baptist, let me say this about him. There's not a man born a woman any greater than John the Baptist. I see that messenger, he goes back to that cell and John's waiting on an answer from his God what did he say what did he say he said John this is what he said the blind is a seeing and the lame is a walking and the dead are being raised and the poor people are having the gospel preached to him what else did he say he said you the man <laughs> Woo! God had a purpose for John the Baptist's life now listen to this John the Baptist so fulfilled his purpose. John the Baptist so fulfilled the plan of God for his life. When they beheaded him and threw his body in the valley of Gihar, brought his head on that platter to that ungodly woman. They thought he was dead. A couple of days later, this other man walks into the palace and he starts preaching. And the king's wife said, oh my God, I know who that is. Who is it? That's John the Baptist raised from the dead. Well, I didn't think they believed in any of that. It's amazing what you believe in when you get the holy terror scared out of you. That's John the Baptist raised from the dead. No, no, sister. It's not John the Baptist raised from the dead. It's the light. It's the lamb. It's the one that John preached about. John, listen to this, was so much. Listen. John was so much like Jesus Christ that when he was dead and Jesus Christ come on the scene, they thought it was him. Woo! You talking about fulfillment. 
fulfilling a purpose in life? You say, what has that got to do with Jesus? I read it in the text in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. He said, it's written in the volume of the books, I'm coming and I'm coming to do one thing, to do thy will, O God, to fulfill your plan and your purpose in my life and to show you how serious Jesus was about that. Remember, back in the temple, at around age 10 to 12, at his bar mitness, his mom and daddy went home and forgot him. I saw that one time at dad's church when I was a little boy, I remember this. We all walked across the parking lot to the parsonage. About 30 minutes after church, my daddy always drunk a big old glass of cherry Kool-Aid when he got through pre- We called him the Kool-Aid Kid. A banana and peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a big old glass of cherry Kool-Aid. I don't think I can handle that. I believe that's worse than Corona. I'm gonna be honest with you. Phone rang. Brother JB, this is so-and-so. We've left Junior at church. Daddy ran over there and Junior was like most Baptists. He was still asleep. Church had started, continued, and ended, and he never even woke up. They lost Jesus. They couldn't find him. Boy, when they came back, find him he was sitting in the midst of all of those doctors and philosophers astounding them Joseph said where have you been Jesus very kindly very respectfully very politely said to Joseph and Mary I must be about my father's business can you imagine what went on in the minds of all of those people. There stands who they think is his father with the rough hewn hands of a carpenter standing in a gold ivory clad synagogue. I must be about my father's business. And I see them look at Jesus and I see them look at Joseph and I can just see it going through their mind. What is his father have anything to do with the business in one of these fine synagogues. He needs to be in the back carpenter shop. Little did, well, glory to God, little did they know. They wouldn't, he wasn't talking about his father on earth by the name of Joseph. He was talking about his sovereign, immaculate, perfect, holy father, the God of eternity, the God of eternal ages. Hey, Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. He was so sincere and complete about it, he could say this to his disciples. In fact, I've done such a job. I do always those things that please my father. He'd been so thorough and complete with it, he could say this. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. He was so intent in finishing it that in the Garden of Gethsemane, that cup, and in that cup was every dirty, rotten, diabolical, filthy sin, past, present, and future. And Jesus looked at it and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he drank every drop of the dregs of that cup. And he could pray in John 17 in his high priestly prayer, Father, I finished the work that thou hast given me to do. And oh, that sixth cry from dark Calvary, it's finished. And the veil of the temple was written twain and the rocks rent. I believe Jesus Christ was the purposeful son. God had a plan for his life. God had a purpose for his life. And he filled it and completed it. Left no stones unturned, no T's uncrossed, no I's undotted. Perfect perfect Savior. By the way, God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for me. 
and it's directly linked to the Lord Jesus Christ because you know what he said before he ascended back into heaven to those disciples in that upper room. He not only said, I give you peace. Not only did he show him his hands and his side, I give you proof. He said, well, I'll even give you power. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. But I want to give you a purpose and a plan as the Father sent me. So send I you. Leave this little room and go to the four corners of the earth and preach the gospel to every creature and tell the good news. I'm the Savior. Hallelujah. That's not an accident. That's not a oops. That's not an unexpected, unwanted pregnancy. It was not an accident because he's the promised son, the powerful son, the purposeful son. And in closing this morning, that leads me to the last birth that was pre-announced by the angels. Man, wouldn't it have been something for the angels to come out and say, Isaac's coming. Wouldn't it have been wonderful that night when the angel came out and said, Samson is coming. Man, wouldn't it have been wonderful that afternoon in that little room of the, of the temple when the angel said to John the Baptist's dad, John the Baptist is coming. And I'm not taking away from none of those. But listen to this. God spoke to an individual on all of those. Oh, but when God, hallelujah, gets ready for the angels to pre-announce the arrival of his son, it's more than one. I don't know how many shepherds it was, but I know this, if you'd have been standing there that night, you'd have heard it too. And I'll tell you one thing, all of heaven heard it, all of heaven heard it, and I bless God, I believe all of hell heard it. Because the angels decked to the Judean hills, oh, they feel the choir loft of heaven and sang with a harmony that Everybody sings in, in the glory world and as a star pointed out its silver finger and held it over a manger. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, for he shall, here it is now, save his people from their sins. Oh, there it is. There it is. Isaac, the promised son, Samson, the powerful son, John the Baptist, the purposeful son. Well, oh, here is Jesus, and I call him the pardoning son, the son that offers pardon and forgiveness. You know, Isaac fulfilled some prophecy. Samson defeated some enemies. John the Baptist preached some hair raising sermons. But Isaac, take away sin Samson couldn't take away sin even John the Baptist couldn't take away sin oh but laying in a manger this Christmas morning announced by the angels on Christmas Eve evening this child whoop the Christ child, Jesus, the Son of God. He's the only one that ever before or ever will be able to take away sin. He is, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Oh, he could offer pardon, pardon. Now, I love the real theologians that crosses every I and crosses every T and you know, they got all their dispensations, right? I believe in all of that. But listen to me. All the Bible is not written to me. I know that, but it's all written for me. And there's always an ultra dispensationalist somewhere that jumps on me when I use the word pardon. That's Old Testament words. Well, so is backsliding. And how many times have you done that? Or how many times have you called somebody a backslider? Unless she's like one of the dear members of our church that's in glory. He got excited one morning giving a testimony and he said, Brother Joe, I want to tell you what's wrong with some of these people around here in Jonesboro. They're just a bunch of backslitters. <laughs> that word pardon may be an Old Testament term. Oh, but it was fulfilled with a New Testament Savior. 
You said, oh, Brother Joe, when a criminal is pardoned, there's still a record, and God tore up our record. We're not pardoned, we're justified. I know. But I'm still glad Jesus signed my pardon. And then he tore it up, and now I am justified. So I'm just using that word for forgiveness, restoration, deliverance, redemption, I'm glad he pardoned me, hallelujah. I'm glad I got saved. I'm glad I received the redemption as they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, and he pointed his face to us as a flint towards Calvary. And finally, 33 years later on the cross, he cried, it's finished. But when he cried, it is finished, that was just the beginning. And living, he loved me. And dying, he saved me. And buried, he carried my sins far away. And rising, he justified and freely forever. And one day, he's coming. All glory day I'm glad he is the pardoning savior that offers pardon and salvation to all who will call upon his name thou shalt call his name Jesus Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin call him Christ Messiah the anointed chosen one. That means he's the anointed Savior, the chosen Savior. Call him Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of all saviors, the King Savior, the Lord Savior, the Chief Savior, the only Savior. Call him Lord Jesus Christ. Call him Christ Jesus the Lord. Call him Jesus, Lord Christ. Ever how, or call him the Lord's Christ. Ever how you want to put it. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. And he was not an accident. He's the pardoning Savior that offers forgiveness from sin to everyone that'll call upon his name. I love this song. Terry Gardner, if you're listening today, I love you, Terry, and I miss you, son. This is Terry Gardner's favorite hymn in the book. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The second verse of that song was Mace Jackson's favorite verse of any song in the hymn book. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I so vile as he, wash all my sins away. Can I do that Mays Jackson style? You don't mind if I do that Mays Jackson style? I've, I've heard him preach ever since I was a little boy. He's in heaven now. This is exactly, hey, praise God, beloved. I love the second verse of that song. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there be I, though vile as he, bless God, wash all my sins away. Hallelujah, say amen right there. Praise God, I'm glad Jesus is the pardoning Savior. I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina and Virginia. And uh, a lot of our songs get made fun of by great theologians. I know this preacher at one time, a man visited his church from a famous, famous college known for its fine music. And he walked up to this preacher and said, I believe the Lord sent me here to help your music program. <laughs> that preacher goes, hey man, we've been playing for a steel guitar player. Come on, preacher. That ain't the kind of help he was talking about. But I love some of them old gospel songs. I remember being in church. They had a piano, but it was unplayable. So we'd grab them guitars and go to singing. I remember this one. Way down in the country, a little dirt road. There's a little church down there. And I remember this man and wife getting up to sing. The guitar looked like it came over on Noah's Ark. Looked like it had been through the lion's den and the fire furnace and seven years of Jacob's trouble. He had a piece of bailing wire for the strap on it. I don't know what he used for a pick, but God helped those diamond back strings. I wasn't much of a picker then myself, not now, but definitely back then, but I knew it. 
Oh boy, you're doing the best you can. But Sunday had the Holy Ghost dripping off of them. And they'd get together and they'd sing this Jesus signed my pardon. This I surely know. Took my place on Calvary. No, I don't have to go. All my life I give him. He gave his for me. When he signed my pardon there at Calvary. I was in since prison, oh, so dark and cold, like a lost sheep wandering from God's eternal foal. Then the door swung open. Jesus spoke to me. <laughs> Whoo! I have signed your pardon. Now you may go free. Jesus signed my pardon. This I surely know. Took my place on Calvary. Now I don't have to go. All my life I give him. He gave his for me. When he signed my pardon there at Calvary. Amen. I'm glad today our sins have been forgiven. Our past has been erased. Our position in Christ is settled and our future is secure because Christ is our hope and anchor of the soul. His birth was not an accident. Oh, he's better than Isaac, the promised son. He's better than Samson, the powerful son. He's better than John the Baptist, the purposeful son. He is the pardoning son, the eternal son, higher than the highest, better than the best, greater than the greatest, and Jesus is his name. In sorrow, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. In trouble, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. In bewilderment, distress, and confusion, in fear and doubt, I'm glad I know who Jesus is. If you're watching this program today or later on in the week, you come by this program, Jesus loves you. He came to give you life, and not just life, but abundant life. If you'll put your faith and trust in him, he'll save you today. If you're here today and you're listening and you're watching and you've got troubles and you're afraid, you've got needs, he's able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we ask or think. One final word to our church family at Harvest. If you need something, especially those who, I want to say live alone, but you don't live alone. Jesus is right there with you. But if you need us, please call us. Joseph, Tom, myself, others will assist you any way that we can. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And I want to thank you, Lord, for this open door and this opportunity to reach our church family, but Lord, others. And I pray for these, Lord, today that may be lost. They'll trust Jesus those who have burdens and needs today may they trust Jesus look to the author and the finisher of our faith you do all things well and we love you today we worship you today we trust you today Lord I feel like the Hebrew children who and I in heaven but thee and Lord I'm glad today you're not just enough you're more than enough. You're able to do exceeding abundant of all that we ask or think. Bless the program. Bless our people. Heal our nation. Heal our families. We'll give you the glory and the praise because we ask it in Jesus' name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name let's do that refrain one more time kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something 
about that name. God bless you. We'll see you tonight, the Lord willing.